I think one of the key key topics that I'd, that I'd like to point to is somewhere between design and serendipity. And I think that has come up a lot in my career and, and you'll probably see that a lot in the work. That there's this fine line where it's not all luck and it's not all design and you can never have either one. But it's trying to find a balance between those. And when you get lucky, you gotta know you got lucky and you gotta take, it, take advantage of it. But you also need to know how to design this path so you're headed in the right direction so you can get lucky, et cetera. Um, but to kind of start way back, I, um, as a kid, I always wanted to be an artist or, or be an architect. And my grandfather was an architect. My aunts and uncles were artists. Um, so there was a lot of creativity in the family. But I have two psychologist parents. So that was the, the total opposite. Not that they're not creative, but uh, I was not going that direction. <laughs> um, and so I, I was kind of the wild, hyper, crazy, creative kid. Um, and, I, and I thought architecture was going to be this, uh, how can I say, professional art form. I saw my aunts and uncles struggling in art and struggling to make a, a living and, and super creative, super talented, but just super difficult life. So I thought, you know, architecture, this is a professional art form. This is where I should go. Um, so I, I took a lot of art classes in, in high school and I took drafting classes and, and CAD classes and, uh, you know, wood shop and photography and everything you could, you could think about how to make stuff, how to design, how to uh, be creative. Then I went to architecture school. I um, went to a professional degree. So in architecture, you basically do uh, either five-year undergrad degree, which gives you a professional degree in architecture, and then you can sit for your license or you do a four-year degree in anything, and then you do a three-and-a-half-year de master's degree. So I went and I did a five-year professional degree at a super small school, uh, Philadelphia University. Probably no one here has heard of it. It's roughly 2,000 people, so smaller than my high school. Uh, and I'm from Philadelphia. And so I'd, there was basically three schools in Philadelphia. I was going to stay close. There's Drexel Temple and, and Philly U, which is where I went. Um, Phil, it looks like we're having trouble. Hopefully, we'll get you a video. I'll just keep blabbing away until we get a video. Um, student that has his laptop with you, does that help? Uh, it has videos loaded on it, I guess, which I don't even know what videos, but hopefully they're good ones. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, it's all right. So yeah, I went to Philly U, super small school. Um, and I, I, at the time, I thought, you know, it's better to be a big fish in a little pond than trying to fight this huge system, which was um, Drexel and Temple in, in terms of Philadelphia. Um, and, you know, I did really well in, in high school and I, I had good grades. SATs, okay, nothing exceptional. Um, so I got into this small school. And I think it really paid off in the end that I um, had a great community of teachers and students and ended up excelling throughout, throughout undergrad. Um, and I started to find mentors and, and faculty in the school that I would work with in the summers or in between classes and things like that. And so I, I found one or two that were really key mentors and I ended up working with them for multiple years. One of those mentors um, had worked with a woman named Zaha Hadid. And Zaha Hadid now is one of the most famous architects in the world. Um, and she was in London and she had a practice that was emerging, still a prominent architect. She's now called a star architect. So you know when you get famous as an architect and they call you a star architect, you're good. So she's like Frank Gehry status. Probably everyone here has heard of Frank Gehry or like Frank Lloyd Wright status. Anyway, so he was good friends with her and he sent me to London to work with her. And so that was kind of the moment that something was happening, that a mentor had taken a chance on you and you had kind of proven yourself uh, and, and worked really hard. And there was nothing exceptional about what I was doing. It's just dedication and passion, et cetera. And he took a chance. And so I went to London, and I worked at Zaha's office. And I had a project manager there that was um, teaching himself how to write code. And he was, he was um, just pushing the limits of software and, and kind of going wild. And everyone was like, look at this guy. This guy's doing crazy stuff. What is he doing? Computer science and architecture. Um, and he's a young guy. And we were doing a bunch of competitions. I had an amazing experience there. And, and when I left, he ended up coming back to New York and I was in Philadelphia. And from that time, he was the only person that I knew of or many people knew that was writing code. And that inspired me to kind of push the limits because in, 
in the design world, as I'm sure in many disciplines, you have tools, right? People give you tools, whether they're software tools or their equipment or their skill sets, et cetera. And this was the first time that someone was making their own tools that, or that I saw. They were pushing the limits of what people gave them to say, we're going to make our own and we're going to excel much further than we could have with the standard tools. And uh, so that inspired me to start learning how to write code. I'm in this architecture school. I had, I think, uh, a year left or a year and a half left in architecture school at that time. So I'm writing code, and, and all my professors are like, why is this guy writing code in architecture school? We, super weird. Um, and, and so then that kind of blossomed, and I started a blog, and I was posting everything I was doing on the blog. And it was early days of blogs, so not a ton of people had that. And it started to get people to notice what I was doing because it was maybe just so weird, um, pushing the limits. But because that mentor had moved to New York, we started to collaborate. And I, and I got an opportunity to host an exhibition because I went to this gallery that was in Philadelphia. And I, I forget how I even got connected to them. But I basically showed them some of this weird stuff I was doing because I was proud of it. And they thought it was weird. But they said, you know, instead of exhibiting here, maybe you curate an exhibition. Um, and I was like, I don't know how to curate an exhibition, but maybe the mentor knows how to curate an exhibition. So I contacted him again and said, why don't we team up on this? Maybe we can make an exhibition. And so we, we made an exhibition called Scripted by Purpose. Uh, this was in 2007, uh, six, seven, something like that. And what we did was we gathered all the people that we could find that were interested in this thing that we were interested in. That It was a super small community, but gathered everyone we could find. Um, and some of those people ended up being fairly well respected in the industry and other people were just like us. And it became this moment in time that either we got lucky or we designed it, but it became like the exhibition in the field that said people are interested in code and code is a new way to design. And because of that, that just propelled both of our careers because all the people that we invited then in turn invited us to all these other things. And so they would invite us to do exhibitions, and they would invite us to do galleries and sculptures and all these kind of things. So that started this chain reaction of, of opportunity. So number one, we built this community. Number, one, number two, we identified it a field, and us as leaders in the field, even though we maybe weren't, but we created this thing. And three, we created this chain reaction of, of work along the way. And so right at the and I was still an undergrad doing this. Um, and because of this blog, people had, and because of this exhibition, people started seeing it. And I, I then had gotten invited to the MoMA, and the MoMA had had this big show called Design in the Elastic Mind. So I'm in undergrad, and I have no practice, and I've never done anything outside of undergrad, and the MoMA is inviting me to be part. And, and it's just like, seems all like a lie, because no one really knows what's going on here. And they, they don't even know that I'm I don't even know how old I was, 20, 21 or 22 or something. They, they have no idea who's on the other, other end of this blog. So it was a strange, uh, a strange moment, but that kind of led me to believe that it's just if you find this passion and if you find, or and if you drive and you work hard enough and focus on the things you're doing, all the other stuff doesn't matter and, and that other things will happen because of it. Right, that um, it's sort of like you fake it till you make it, but you're not purposefully faking it, you're just doing it, and, and you think you're faking it, but everyone else thinks you're not faking it, and then it becomes real. <laughs> and, and then I applied to MIT and I got in, and you're just like, whoa. There's no, if I went from high school and applied to MIT, there's no way I would have gotten in. Uh, even if I was in Philadelphia University architecture school applying to MIT, just generally, there's no way. But because of this passion and this weird thing that I just took on and started to build a community around and try to put myself out there and say, this is what I'm doing, take it or leave it, and I'm, I have no idea why, I'm just doing it. I'm going to do a lot of it as hard as I can. And then it worked, and then they accepted me at MIT. And so I went to MIT, and I found out all my colleagues felt the same way. They're like, oh, I, think it was, I think it was fake. I think they messed up. I shouldn't have been here. And we all felt like that. We felt like... I can't believe I got in. There's no way I should have been here. This is crazy. Um, but we also found that there's a big difference between MIT undergrad and MIT grad, right? And like I said, there's no way I would have gotten into MIT undergrad. Just no way because of my grades and SATs and things like that. 
Uh, even though I, I was doing well, it's just, it's another level. But grad school for me was this opportunity to say, you can prove yourself. Undergrad is like a proving ground. It's like work hard, build mentors, do the things you want to do, find a passion, find a drive, and you can prove that you can do anything you want. And then grad school is like, okay, you've proven yourself, now we'll let you go to MIT and do some weird stuff again, even though I was already doing weird stuff. Um, and so then I went to this program called Design Computation at MIT, and, and again, it's super strange, this combination of design and computing. Uh, I was under the architecture department, and through that, I then ended up doing a dual degree, and it's sort of like the same thing, that um, I feel like MIT took a chance on me, and there's no reason I should have been there, and then because of that chance, I squirmed my way through MIT and, and basically took it as a ticket. Like, here's a free ride to MIT to do whatever you want to do. And, and this course I was in was super open. There was almost no curriculum, um, really no guidance, which a lot of my classmates just flopped at. But it, if you take that as an opportunity and you say, okay, they're giving me two years to do whatever I want, then I found a way to have a dual degree in computer science and left there in two years, got two masters, and then before graduating, they hired me as faculty. And again, you're just like, what? Why? All right, I'm gonna just go with it. Fake it till you make it. I have no idea how to be faculty, but I'm just gonna do it. Um, and half of the people I'm teaching are older than me because most of the people, um, I had gone straight through. I, f I did five years, two years, two masters, faculty. Most of these other people did four years, then they worked somewhere, and then they came back, and now they're doing a three and a half year masters. And so half of them were older than me, and I'm, and I'm teaching them. No idea what to do, but um, just kind of telling them what I think and, and just having passion and working with them and, and spending the time to do it. And so I've now been at MIT for six years. This is the end of the sixth year, going on seven. Uh, two years as a student, four years as faculty. Um, a year ago, I started a research lab because while I was at MIT, I, you know, again, found these mentors and I found a passion, which was slightly different than the passion before. Um, it's still about code. Before it was about how code could change what you can design. Now it's about how code can change what you can build. Um, and, and I just started doing projects. And, and half of these weren't even commissioned, similar to the blog, where no one was saying, here's a project or we need you to do something. We don't, it's just like, I did it because I wanted to do it and no one's gonna stop me. And I just kept doing stuff. And because of that, it, it built a body of work, and then it built recognition. And then the uh, head of the architecture department said, why don't you start a lab? I know you're interested in research. I'm like, whoa, never thought about that, but okay. Yeah, I'll do it, fake it till you make it, I'll start a lab, and I don't know what that means, but, um, and now I'm, I'm finishing the first year of the lab, and, and all the, the stuff in the lab is the same, like how do you advise, or how do you manage a lab? How do you fundraise? How do you advise students? How do you, apply for big government grants and teach all at the same time, and none of them I know how to do, but I think it's just the same that you just, you fight and you work hard and you do something that you're really super passionate about. No one else knows either. When they started, they didn't know, and, and half the people, you think they can tell you're faking it, but they have no idea that you're not the expert in the field, and then you become the expert in the field because it's a field of one, and so then you're the only one doing it. Um, so it's kind of this weird, weird road, and that's where I am now. Um, no idea where it's going, but it, it's kind of the same thing. Just put blinders on and keep going. Something will happen. Hopefully something good. Um, so I don't know where that's, that's leaving me for the future of like what the answer of what you guys can do or, or like keys to success. But, um, but I think part of it is that you need to find something that you're passionate about. Not, throughout school, throughout work, throughout whatever, I cannot imagine just going to a nine to five job or listening to someone telling me what to do. It just wasn't my thing. So it's like, this to me was the best thing ever. It was just like my own art project as a career. I could just do what I wanted to do. No one's gonna tell me not to do it. And because of that passion, you're working every hour of the day. You're working at night, you're working on the weekends, you're working on holidays. You're, no one can stop you because it's like the thing you wanted to do. And if you can find that, then it's limitless. And, and so I guess that would be the big piece of advice that you need to find the passion 
And it doesn't even have to be like in a category, a silo. It doesn't have to be, you know, chemistry is my passion or math is my passion. I think the most interesting things are actually in between those. You have to find it like specialized to you. So the mix of like chemistry and computer science is like, I don't know what that means, but that could be a crazy zone. That could be your zone. <laughs> or uh, I don't know, architecture and computer science are like astrophysics and nanotech. Or I don't know. Put some weird things together and, and find a passion that no one else has, and then you're an expert of one. Um, so maybe we can get these videos up. What are you thinking? Um, are they online? <laughs> I don't know. I thought they were loaded on the computer. Well, they are online. I could find them. But in, maybe in the meantime, why don't we open it up to questions and discussions, and if we can pull it up, it's good. How's that sound? Yeah, I was trying to type, but I don't know where to go to get the, the video. Okay. Um, I can, yeah, I can pull one up. We got this external drive too. Or, uh, I don't know if it's or, uh, well, do you know if it's on there? Or no? I don't know. I can play the. Okay. All right, I say we skip the videos. Looks like it's super slow, so you're probably not gonna get it. I'll, you'll see a lot of videos, too many videos in, in a couple hours, don't worry about it. Uh, we do weird stuff, super crazy, somewhere betwixt, between art, design, science, engineering. Uh, I was joking with my students the other day because um, we were doing an experiment and we got super lucky. Again, I think we ride this line of luck and design, but um, we were joking and said, well, there's no luck in science, there's only magic. And so we try to find, we try to find the magic in it. Uh, and we, we focus on two topics. One is self-assembly. So the, the research lab is called the self-assembly lab. <clears throat> and the other one is programmable materials. And I'll tell you what that means and why we do that and stuff later. But um, does anyone have questions, comments, thoughts? Sure. Nice. And, uh, maybe look about the spacecraft that go out forty three to forty. Do mm -hmm. you have a type of shelter for these that they have in their toys? Yeah, um so space is a super ripe application for what we do. And we're talking to a bunch of people in that space, in the space space. Um and so I think number one, that's that's a w an area that we can explore to utilize self assembly, but as you're pointing to there are things like uh, folding telescopes, folding antennas. Um, there are technologies that have already been deployed that are very close to what we're proposing. I would say one, one big difference is that they're potentially, the existing uh, technologies are, are usually robotic scenarios. And so we're trying to find ways that they passively assemble themselves. Um, but it's a great challenge because you have a minimum volume, you have to minimize weight, and you need to ship things up. But then you, need, you want to make really large scale functioning st structures. So that challenge of how do you get things there, it's really difficult for humans to assemble things in space. And therefore, again, if we can have smarter materials that assemble themselves, it's a super ripe application. Yeah. In the back? Uh, I have two questions, if I may. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, great question. Um, so I think one novel aspect of our work, or maybe the only one, is the scale we're working at, which is huge stuff. I come from an architecture background, so we work on macro scale self-assembly. Um, so that means essentially products scale and larger. So physical things up to manufacturing applications and machine scenarios and architecture and space. So we try to utilize these principles that are mostly found at small scales, like nanotech, synbio, chemistry, material science, all are fundamentally built around self-assembly, self-replication, reconfiguration, et cetera. And so we try to utilize those as new industrial processes, <clears throat> new manufacturing scenarios, uh, or new ways to interact with physical materials and products. So that's one thing that sets us apart, because at very small scales, um, first of all, biology has been doing self-assembly forever. And second of all, every biologist, chemist, material scientist, physicist knows about these processes and utilizes these processes all the time. And so in, in that case, it's a great avenue for us to collaborate. So on the other end of the spectrum, we have worked on some nanoscale scenarios. I'll show a project where we were doing DNA printing. So we, we synthesize custom strands of DNA and then we print them like a sensor. And so those, those strands of DNA then react to their environment or to their neighbors, et cetera. So we have worked on that. Um, but most of the time we try to collaborate with people that work in that space. Like that's their kingdom and they know how to do it way better than us. But the principles can translate. Even if the energy doesn't translate, even if the materials don't translate or the functionality doesn't, the reasons why it works and the system underneath of those fundamental principles are 100% universal across scales. And so we try to collaborate with people um, at much smaller scales. On the biomimetic side, that was your second point, um, I try to be careful about that. So biomimicry is a big topic right now. If The vision is if you can mimic biology, then we can make better engineered systems or better design systems. And I think in some ways it's correct, but on the other hand, I think it's a little bit of a trap because um, it becomes a dogma that if biology is good, therefore anything I do, I do that looks like biology is also good. And, th and that becomes a trap. Or you say, if biology works like this and I do it based on biology, then it's great how it works, even though there may be a better solution. And there's a lot of research out there that says biology is not optimal. Um, and, and that's very specific because if you look at how any system developed, um, there, it was under very specific conditions, under very specific constraints, and it could have gone this way or it could have gone that way. And it went one way because of an evolutionary pressure and, and all these other circumstances. But the optimal solution may be out here and it may never have gotten there. And so I, I think we try to be really careful. We, most of the time when we work on systems that are influenced by biology, we work closely with a molecular biologist or a chemist, et cetera. And, and we try to extract principles and make it work at larger scales with different materials and different, and, and different energies, et cetera. Uh, so we're very careful about how we translate it. Um, so it's kind of a yes and no. It's a delicate balance because I often see some of my colleagues or people around the world that are so into biomimicry that you lose sight of the reasons to be mimicking biology or the reasons to design new systems. And so we're also interested in non-natural systems that totally synthetic applications can do the same thing um, and totally non-biological processes can do the same thing. So, so I see it more as a universal system, but that biology is one of the best examples we can find. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the tool we use to make better solar panels and wind turbines? Yeah, actually, uh, in Europe, they just opened a uh, directed self-assembly center. So it's a center across Europe, and there's going to be biochem material physicist researchers there. And they're gonna use self-assembly to try to make better materials. And that could be on the solar panels themselves, it could be on coatings, it could be on uh, new chips, new, any, any new material. And they're, they're trying to use self-assembly where they agitate materials, they flow fluids, they um, use, you name it, like any forces at micro to nano scales to create new material properties that they couldn't have created otherwise because machines and human tolerances and all these, thing, all these things limit 
the precision and the constructs of how we make materials. So if they can use those properties to make materials themselves, the materials make the materials, um, then there's a whole new space that opens up for invention and engineering new materials. So for sure, we don't necessarily work on that specifically. We work on more large-scale systems like how the solar arrays would assemble themselves or reconfigure themselves. Um, so more macro scale than materials themselves, but yeah, there's a lot of people working in that space. Yep. yep. Yeah, great question. And I'll talk a little bit more about it later on, but basically the definition of self-assembly is um, disordered parts that come together uh, through local interaction and, and interaction with their environment. So no, if you have a bunch of parts on the table, I don't pick them up and place them, or a robot doesn't pick them up and place them, but rather they can build precise things um, just by their influence with their surroundings. And, and so that is the fundamental principle of how biology is built and how chemistry works and how um, materials and crystals and phase change works. So. Yeah, but it also happens, um, like I said before, in, in non-natural systems. And you could think about like, or let's say non-biological systems, you could say astrophysics is another example. If you think about it, it's sort of like bottom-up um, processes that if there is no top-down control, um, in general, I would... I think everyone agrees that there's probably no robot arm out in space moving planets, and there's probably not one like manufacturing a new star. Um, so then generally those things are left to their own devices to figure out where to go and what happens if they collide and uh, how to organize themselves. And, and that becomes based on matter and based on energy. And so you know at every scale, uh, when there is no top-down control, you usually get self-organization, self-assembly, et cetera. The only difference is at the human scale, we've become super good at top-down control and, we've, and manufacturing, construction. Um, even if you wanna make furniture in your garage, you go there and you slam stuff together. You get out a sledgehammer and a screwdriver and a welder and bolts and you force stuff together. And uh, in computer science, that's normally thought of as brute force. And so we're trying to find ways that you can embed decision making or um, simple programs into these materials for them to assemble themselves. Yeah. Um, it really depends across the scale and materials and all that. Uh, but I, th I think the broader question is how much energy goes in based on how much energy you get out. Uh, and, and so, you know, that's an interesting discussion because what we're trying to do is find ways to streamline how you produce these smarter parts. If you spend a ton of time either making smart parts or a ton of time self-assembling something, then you might as well just do it by yourself or with a robot. Uh, and so there, there's a trade-off there. And so we're trying to streamline that. Some of our work that I'll show called 4D printing, I think is the best one, where we can just literally print an object and then it has the program and capability to, to transform itself. So it doesn't take any longer to produce a normal object than it does to produce a smart object. So that's where we want to go. Um, and then the second question is, how long does it take versus hand assembly? And my normal answer to that is, um, I'll show one where you shake this thing and it self assembles, and if you, if I raced you, you probably would win, not all the time, but most of the time you'd probably win by hand. Um, but the moment that you start to do many, this self-assembly system is certainly gonna win, uh, and it's especially because of a few things. Number one, if you have a continuous stock of material, which you would in any manufacturing system, and you're weeding out successful ones, um, the odds of any one of them assembling extremely quickly are very good. Some of them will take much longer, but those ones will get weeded out. So you'll have this yield of many, many parts that are gonna be assembled much faster than if you pick in place or you, or you hand assemble. Plus, it's gonna be um, much less expensive than a super expensive, precise robotic machine trying to assemble all these things. Uh, and, and also, the, the huge part of 
exporting labor out of the US is hand assembly. That if you look at most of those jobs are human assembly and where it's getting automated, it can either come back or it's gonna shift into a different price range. Uh, a good example is consumer electronics. That if you take most of the components, there's the circuit boards and there's automated pick and place for the circuit boards and then there's the manufacturing and the enclosures and the assembly is the com combination of those two, screwing things together and putting parts together, et cetera. And so I think there's a huge advantage there if you can have parts that assemble themselves um, that would potentially be faster and cheaper than doing it with a human and also cheaper than doing it with a robot. So it kind of depends on the application. If you want to make one thing, you might be better off putting the energy in, in doing it yourself. Uh, if you need to make many, then it's probably another way. Or if your, your environment or your situation is fluctuating or you can't assemble it, like space is a good example or super small scales is a good example or dangerous scenarios or hard to reach, et cetera, then self-assembly wins. Yeah. Uh, we'll go up here. Mm -hmm. So it's not a universal number. It, you know, it depends on many factors. Uh, depends on how you've designed it, how you control your energy input, you know, all of these things. But I would guess I would point to two things that I, I think are the best arguments for efficiency. One is biological self-assembly, and um, it's done extremely well. The amount of errors to success rates is astronomical, and there's no human-made system that can compare across any, in terms of number of parts, Avogadro's number to errors is like unbelievable. So self-assembly can be that efficient. Can we design it that way? That's a huge challenge and maybe, maybe not. Um, and then the other one I would point to is digital information that uh, we look at a principle called error correction. And if you look back at how analog information transitioned to digital information, um, I would consider our built environment as analog information today. The way we put stuff together is fighting tolerances. If you have errors in your components, those errors propagate and you get worse and worse structures. Right? And that's how analog information, analog communication was. That as distances increased, communication got worse. And so everyone tried to fight that by making better and better components or better and better, better and better signals and all these things to try to get better communication. Digital information came on board and said, that why don't I send more information than I need, knowing that all that information is gonna be bad. So I have, I have poor parts, but I'll send more and I'll majority vote on the other end and I'll weed out errors so that I get a perfect signal no matter what. So it's basically being smart about how you send communication. Uh, and biology does the same thing. A good example is DNA. That DNA is popping in and out, popping in and out, super weak local interactions, but the moment that you have a number of successful ones, it gets stronger and stronger and stronger, so they weed out errors. Um, a good example would be if you try to build a circle with a number of components. If those components have tolerances, you'll place them, and when you get back here, you're gonna be like way off. You're gonna be here or here, right? But if you try to have um, weaker connections that can fluctuate, and you, you build a little bit of fluctuation into those components, when you get to the end, the circle will fix itself, right? And so you're trying to find a way that the system can majority vote to error correct on the whole structure. So th I think I need a PhD student to do a dissertation on that, but basically combining biological error, digital information, uh, and majority voting, and, and construction tolerance. And there's no fundamental theory of construction tolerance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, It, it's hard to say because most of the demonstrations we're doing are we're not trying to prove efficiency. Maybe we should be. Um, and going forward, we probably will be. As, as these get implemented in manufacturing scenarios, that's obviously the number one question that people want to know. For us, in the beginning, it was like, is this possible? Can we even do it? And then now it's um, mostly about demonstrations. Like, if I put in these components, what comes out? Or if I put in a lot of components, can I get different results, like solid liquids gases, instead of one final product? 
Um, so most of ours are, are demonstrations and, and not necessarily trying to prove efficiency. Uh, I guess the best answer that I can give you is to show the videos and you can see how efficient they are. But generally, you know it's going to happen. The thing you don't know is how long it's going to take. You know it's always going to build the right thing, for sure. But you don't know if it's going to take many minutes, hours, years. You don't know if it's going to take two seconds. So that is a challenge, actually, for manufacturing, because everyone wants to know time and yield. And what we need to do is, is find systems that we can shift the mentality of um, being OK with stochastic processes, not having to know that every single part is coming out exactly at the same time, but that the larger system may still be very, very efficient. Even if one part took a lot longer, the next part might take no time at all, might instantly build. So it's more like a global efficiency that we need, but we don't really have hard numbers yet, mostly because it's not implemented. But Yeah. So a lot of people would say that 3D printing is the replicator and even MakerBot calls their printer the replicator. I think it's obviously not true. If you look at the RepRap, that's one of the first 3D printers that they say they're, it's a self-replicating machine. It's obviously not true because it ignores the assembly process afterwards. It prints parts that can be put into the printer, but it can't make the printer itself. So there's a big gap there. There's been some on uh, self-replicating robotics that have done pretty good. It's basically a fairly sophisticated robot that can pick up other parts and build another robot similar to itself. Um, that's one scenario. And, and then actually one of my favorite is um, Penrose, Lionel Penrose in the 60s, I think, showed these wooden blocks that can self-reproduce. And they're just literally wooden blocks that you agitate and they reproduce patterns. Um, he's actually the father of Penrose, like Penrose tiling. Um, so there's some interest in, and we have some, and we're trying to develop systems there. But I think the bigger question you're, you're asking is like, when can we produce out of thin air physical material, physical constructs that have any material and any functionality? And a couple different threads are, uh, threads are pointing in that direction. 3D printing is pointing in the direction that out of thin air you can produce physical objects. The material properties today are pretty poor. So you're not going to make your cup of, co cup of coffee and your laptop and your Nike shoes on the same machine. But different machines could produce different products. Uh, so trying to combine those into one, there's definitely some researchers looking at that. The functionality part, I think I'll point to. Because right now, 3D printers, you produce stuff and they make a bunch of static parts that don't do anything. Uh, so then they need to be assembled into other functional systems. So we're trying to show that you can print things that then have functionality and can transform and reconfigure and stuff. Um, so if you piece all the ingredients together, I think we have one of each ingredient, but they're not all combined. Yep. Yeah, great question. Um, and, and one take on your question is, can you use the same components to build another phone? Which is really fascinating. And, and we would argue, yes, that um, one of the key advantages of these kinds of systems is that if you can self-assemble it, you can self-disassemble it. And then it becomes modular systems that you can break them down to their fundamental components, and you can build many things. So there is no trash anymore. Everything is broken down to its components and built back up. If you look at um, one of the best examples would be a forest. If something dies in the forest, there's no trash. That thing dies, and it deteriorates, and then gets brought back into the soil, and then it's turned into something else. Um, so unless we bring synthetic systems in there, a tree falls over, and it's reused to make another tree. Uh, so we're interested in that process. But the other thing you're pointing towards is 
um, do you need to tweak the parameters every time? Like if one phone company comes to us and say they want to self-assemble their phones and then another phone company comes or they want to do iPads, do we need to change the system? Uh, I think about it like cooking and gardening, that um, in cooking and gardening or baking, you understand that there's certain ingredients and there's certain energy needed for the system, but you don't necessarily have to know exactly how those ingredients are working or how they're interacting with that. You need to make sure they have the right environment and the right ingredients, and useful, precise, functional things come out. And so therefore, it's a collaboration between materials, myself, and the energy. And we can build really useful things that we could never have built otherwise. Like, you can't make a plant if you start putting seeds together, right? It's more than the sum of its parts. You can't construct it. You don't know how the photosynthesis is really working, or even if you do, it doesn't help at all. You just need to give it sunlight and water and the ingredients, right? So I think about it like that in manufacturing, that you're not changing the process. It's still going to be using the same principles, but you may need to give it a little bit more energy, or you may need to give a little bit of more of these materials or those materials. So you have to find a way that there's a science behind this, and we understand what the principles are doing so that we can dial up, dial down, and control this, this environment. And I think that in the beginning, it's going to take a lot of work. Every time we do it, it's going to be like, oh, we've got to figure out everything. We've got to try every energy. We've got to try every cycle and, and you know, different chambers and things like that. But over time, you're going to get better and better and better at it. And you're going to build a system that's going to be able to adapt very easily. Um, and we're going to have you know, America's top chef. And they're going to be like self-assembling phones and any type of phone you want. And they're just going to be awesome at it. And then it's the same thing, but way more efficient than picking and placing our cell phones. Yeah. Uh, sure. Yeah, um, so the question was, do we see it as a weird form of art? It's definitely weird, and it's definitely art, but it's also a lot of other stuff. Um, we, we take public art commissions, and, or we apply for them, and sometimes we get them. Uh, and it's funny, because we'll do a public art commission, and then we'll write a science paper on it. Or we'll you know, try to develop this new phenomenon, or I don't know, invent something, or be super scientific, and be these engineers, and then we'll use it to build a sculpture in a gallery. And, and so we kind of try to oscillate between all of them. Um, any one day, you could come in, and you're this is just a bunch of artists doing weird stuff. It's super beautiful. And then you're like, well, these are nerdy engineers. They're trying to build these mechanisms and make efficient components. And then you're like, oh, wow, they're scientists. They're just really interested in knowledge, discovery, and principles. and uh, and all that. And, and so we're kind of all of those. And one of the things I try to do is have um, students in the lab from all different backgrounds. So we have mechanical engineers, material scientists, energy studies, architects, designers, um, you know, everyone, and try to not care about the silos really. But, but sure, we're, we're artists for sure. And, and we can't, I can't get rid of the design side. So one, another thing that separates us is we go to a uh, science conference and we present and we're the only one that have slides like the slides you're going to see and that's just because I have a background in design and interest in art and uh, so we try to make pretty things too but uh, pretty useful things too <laughs> I don't know so yeah we're all of the above I guess actually I think it's a good point though that um, silos are I think silos are like the death of us. That if we stick to these silos, and, and academia is terri terrible about this, like they'll only give, a, give you a degree in one silo. And that's because they don't know what to do outside of that silo. They don't know what to call you, and society doesn't know what to call you. They're like, oh, you're an artist, science, engineer, I'm not sure. So, but I think those moments in between are super interesting. And that's like, for me, that, that's where I want to be. I don't want to be in any one of those silos. And so you need to find a way to be in between, I think. Yeah. Sure. Sir, uh, you have been talking about energy. What is thought about applying thermodynamics? Too much noise? Did you say aerodynamics? Thermodynamics. Uh, thermodynamics. I mean, it's all thermodynamics. Yeah. It's all thermodynamics is essentially what we're doing. What is the noise? I think this is what we asked you earlier. Mm-hmm. What we asked for is what you said. Yep. 
Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, for sure. And everything we're doing is is based on thermodynamics and based on physics and many other principles. Yeah. So true. You're just so relaxed talking, and you've accomplished so much already. And I'm sure uh, the bunch of like finals are coming up, and we're probably freaking out. And you've done all this, and you're like, "This is what I do." Like, you know, like, how do you attribute that? Like, mm. where is it? Is that your personality? Are you supposed to be these kind of like? Um. Like, how do you get? Yeah, you just fake it till you make it. Yeah. 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 I don't know. Yeah, I'm just faking. It. I'm freaking out up here. I'm just faking. It. Look, it's super calm. Um. I don't know. Again, I think I go back to the passion that um, you could give me all the money in the world or you could take all the money away from me and I'd probably still do the same thing. And I would find a way to have space and people and I'd find a way to do it and be super poor but happy or be super rich and happy. And it's just that you want to do it regardless. So it doesn't matter. Um, and all the other things come and they're great and you know it's good to get the other things and have a stable career and have funding and great people to work with and collaborators and stuff, but it's just because you you find something you're passionate about, and then that one passion leads to another passion, leads to another passion, and then it becomes a career, you know. Yeah. Yep. What is, what is your career? Like, I'm actually yeah. you What does he know? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, kind of you're talking beyond the money. Mm. Kind of the limits that we used to, yeah. like the physics and chemistry. And you kind of combine the whole logistics from all the materials, mm -hmm. particulates, the offshore power, natural power, bio power, chemistry power. You want to put it all in one place. And Yeah, so a couple of good points there. One is um, the I don't know part, and, and I think that's key. Like, just being totally naive is awesome. And like trying to find a way to be naive the, your whole career is like the key to interesting stuff. Seriously, if you go to a silo again, and you get too ingrained, even in my own discipline, if I'm too far into architecture, I'm too far into design, or, or even all my colleagues, you become super cranky and you just think it's not possible and you know the system and everyone tells you it's not possible and you, your legacy trumps innovation, your own legacy. Like what you've already done tells you you can't do it anymore. And so you have to just try to be naive and, and we be, we're naive about everything. We don't know anything about uh, physics and bio and chem. Like, so I, I went from high school straight into architecture from day one, I studied architecture till now. So I'd, Last time I took math was in high school. I tested out of math and physics and all that in college, and I didn't take any since. So the only thing we know is intuition and by collaborating with people. And we're super naive in those. Um, so, I, but I think it's super interesting because we're so dumb that we don't think it's not possible. And we're just like, why isn't that possible? Let's try it. And then you figure out if it does work, why did you get lucky? Or if it didn't work, why didn't it work? But if, even if it didn't work, something else did work. And then you go that way. Uh, and we also you know, try to have students that are experts, and all my students are smarter than me in all those t disciplines, and they're just brilliant. And they offer stuff that I would have never been able to understand. Um, I'll show a project where we were making these neutrally buoyant structures, and, and my, my take on that would be either let's simulate it until we figure out how to create it, or let's just try every possibility until we get it to work. Um, and then my student pipes up and he's like, oh, you need it to be 16 grams and it's neutrally buoyant. And we're just like, 
all right, let's do that. 16 grams, and it just worked. It was like, so sometimes you need experts, sometimes you need to be naive, but probably the experts wouldn't have thought about doing it that way. So I like to be naive in all these disciplines because then you come up with weird ideas. What am I afraid of? Um, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I, th I think uh, the fear is that you wouldn't be able to do the things you want to do. But that's not really true because I said even if I got fired tomorrow, I'd find a way to do it anyway. And it would be in a different place and it would be good as well. And, I'd, you know, there'd be other opportunities. So that's like, you know, that that's a fear. Um, I guess the other fear is that uh, is irrelevance, that um, we have this spectrum between being totally irrelevant, and that's awesome. And if you look super deep in any discipline, they're totally irrelevant. If you look at the extremes of physics, or the extremes of math, or people outside of that are like, what are you talking about? It's totally irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Um, but then it, it does matter, obviously, but everyone else doesn't think it matters. And then the other one is like super applied. Like, so basic research to applied research, right? Super applied research is so relevant that it doesn't matter anymore either because it's just incremental. And it's like, oh, well, I need to make like a tiny percentage improvement over it. And so you just like solve problems and make these super incremental progresses. So you need to be somewhere between irrelevant but applied. Um, and the difficulty is that how do you find that middle zone? How do we not just become irrelevant wackos and how do we not just become like totally applied incrementalists? And, and so that's a fear is like that line is hard to find. Yeah. I think we got to quit. Yeah. Thanks so much.